Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live session. Um, as always, thank you so much for being here. So let's dive in. Uh, as always, there's just a ton to chat about, and I'm obviously here to do a more general Q&A today. Um, I think if you saw the title or you saw the thumbnail um, of this video, it's just it's always a it's always, always a discussion when somebody tells me, hey, Jeff, take a break. And it's something we want to talk about today. Like for me or any creator, how often should we be taking breaks? And it's something to be discussing, especially for anybody who's thinking about being an entrepreneur. And I'm going to wait for the audience to get a little bit bigger to, to discuss this in more detail. Um, but it's just always an interesting subject of how long you stay on YouTube, how often you go live. It's just, it's it's a really, really interesting conversation, I think. So let's just go backwards before we go forward. So yesterday's video, um, you know, I, I'm really candid that a lot of the newer content that I'm creating isn't getting maybe quite the views as some of the content that I created a few years ago. But yesterday's video to me is... It's one of the most critical overlooked items, hands down, when it comes to interviewing. And I <laughs> I would yell this from the rooftops if I could, and I, I would want to yell lots of things from the rooftops when it comes to interviewing. But if you haven't checked out yesterday's video, it's all about implementing visuals in your interview answers. And I give a ton of samples of how to go about it and what a really not great answer looks like as opposed to a really good answer, people really struggle if you do not create visuals for them. <clears throat> and why is this so important? Because this is a more general communication tip as well. If I'm talking about the food I had last night, I'm telling you I had great pepperoni pizza. If I'm telling you about the game I watched last night, it was the Boston Red Sox that I watched. And just these little small visual details go so far in helping and enhancing your interviewers like ability to visualize you going through that journey. Now that can be behavioral where you've done it in the past or that can be on the hypothetical side where they're envisioning, envisioning you in the role. But please check out yesterday's video on visuals. I know it's not going to be a highly watched video, but anybody that watches it and implements more visuals into their interview answers, you're just going to do better in your interviews. And this is tried and true. And this is just, again, more general communication skills. Okay. So as people are jumping in, please say hello. Let me know where you're visiting from. Let me know that you can hear and see me. Okay. Um, I'm going back to hardwiring in, so there's just no Wi-Fi hiccup. So I feel good about that. Uh, but yeah, please, as you come in again, any and all questions are on the table today. Let me do a quick prompt on my services and then we'll dive in. If this is your first time here, my name is Jeff H. Seip. I do one on one coaching. So I do one on one strategy sessions, which are resume, LinkedIn, networking, one on one interview coaching, and then one on one negotiation coaching. As many of you know, I launched my AI practice interview tool. I launched that. Um, it's been about six weeks ago and, and getting really great feedback. And obviously doubling down and iterating on the tool. And then we have our interview mastery course as well. Now for the tool and the interview mastery course, if you use the coupon code bloom today, 15% off the AI tool and 200 bucks off the interview mastery course, this will expire at 1159 Pacific time today for both of those offers. I go live. 9 a.m. Pacific time every Tuesday, new original content every Monday. And if you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, consider subscribing. Okay, <clears throat> let's dive in. And as always, thank you everybody for being here. Okay, Jeff, your insights are invaluable. My Google recruiter specifically recommended your channel to prep for interviews, which I think is the best form of recognition. Yeah, this is always kind of really surprising to me. Uh, I get a lot of recruiters at Google recommending my content. And of course, I don't really know many recruiters left there. I know a few, but most are in lead roles, not really doing the day to day recruiting anymore. So it's so cool uh, when I hear that and that they find my content valuable. Uh, it's really awesome. 
However, with the recent layoffs and general instability in the tech job market, there's less interest in switching jobs, entering new fields right now. So it's okay to take a break if you need one. So we're, we're going to talk about taking a break. And maybe we'll just talk about like work-life balance today or whatever it might be. Um, I'm not intending on taking a break. Uh, and so, you know, kind of again with the funny thumbnail is it's, it's actually really difficult for YouTube creators to take breaks because the algorithm will penalize you for taking a break. Um, it's just kind of one of these realities. Now, if you take a couple weeks off, yeah, it's fine. But if you take months off, which was the suggestion of one of uh, my YouTube viewers, the algorithm will penalize you. And it already penalizes longer term creators. What do I mean by that? It kind of likes to highlight what's hot, what's new. And hey, I get it. But it's already a challenge to beat the algorithm when you've been on YouTube for as long as I have. It's been five and a half years. And so taking any sort of significant break um, is really a deterrent to creators. Secondly, you know, taking a break right after I launched a very significant uh, investment in my app is just not something I'm going to do. And it's not something that really entrepreneurs, most of us can do. Um, it's something where we're going to dive in and dig in as long as we can um, until we can't take it anymore. <laughs> uh, just, my, just my two cents. Hey, Jeff, your live Q&A sessions are one of my favorite things on the internet. If you do take a break, I hope you come back soon. So yeah, again, I, I think I always want to take feedback in. Like we all should take feedback in. I, I strongly believe we can improve without feedback. So all feedback is valuable. And it was a question for today. Uh, I don't intend on taking a break. But if everybody says, hey, Jeff, just chill out and go take a break. Okay, like I understand. Um, I'm two episodes or two sessions away from hitting 156 live sessions, which is three years uh, of a weekly basis of going live. So I definitely want to hit that goal. But um, the intent is to continue going live. Brad, hey, yesterday's video was super helpful. I remember some visuals from my previous jobs and it helped make the job experience more real. Yeah, if you're just hopping on yesterday's video, it's a long video. And by the way, I am low and slow, so you can watch my content at one and a half X, two X. I watch all my own content at two X, actually. I, I do all my learning at, on two X, but um, visuals, so much of it, and let's just spend a, just a second talking about it. So much on the visual side, like when you're giving a behavioral answer and you're setting up that situation and task, so many people say at my last company with the client, uh, we needed to help them. And it, it's just not as clear as if you tell me your role, your company, what type of client, what specifically you needed to help them with, because each one of those items will create visuals for me to be more engaged in your journey and your story. Same thing on the assumptions on the hypothetical side. We're helping a client in the US. It's like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. If you're helping a flip-flop retailer that has brick and mortar and online stores in the US, I have a much better idea of the product area. I can picture it. I can see how you might be able to help them. So if you haven't had a chance, again, definitely check out that video from yesterday. Okay. I went through the process at Google three times in the last two years for an L5 suite. I finally passed the on-site interviews in January and got matched to an awesome project. Okay. Amazing. My recruiter asked for my contacts at Google, expected comp and other data to prepare documents, getting ready for approvals. And some, and these just are some final formalities or I'm not even past HC. You're not past HC. Um, they should really uh, be clarifying that for you. Uh, be using better language to articulate this. What I recommend for anybody pre-HC, um, if you are going to provide internal references, <clears throat> you need to be 100%. They're going to be saying great things about you. If you have <clears throat> any doubts whatsoever, I would just say don't add them. It's not going to be a deterrent to not add them, but adding somebody who does not give you a good reference will stop you. And then on comp, just leave it blank. Leave it zero. Um, make sure you get past HC before you're discussing any of the comp items. It's not going to be a blocker. 
I'm coming off of a little cold, so if I'm a little froggy today, and just an FYI. Hey, Mark from Austin. Oh, I'm so needing to get back to Austin. It's unbelievable. Um, awesome, Brad. Cool. Hey, Liz. Always great to have you here from Sarasota. Amazing. Hey, Jeff. I had my second interview for an ad sales role, which was an RRK. At the, inter- at the end of the interview, I asked the interviewer for feedback. Okay. He told me I was a good candidate had good thought process, but there's an important question I should have done better and shared how he would answer the question. Okay. What do you think about my chance to get a third interview? My first round was a GCA with the hiring manager and it was great overall. Thank you. So Henry, what I always tell people is, um, I just, there's no way I can know the percentages. I know that's a terrible answer. I get it. Um, the fact that they said they liked you and were willing to give you feedback, I see that as an indication of more good potential to move forward, but I really don't know. Even if it wasn't the perfect interview, maybe they didn't like one answer, so they're leaning higher, but maybe the first interview was a higher recommendation, you're definitely going to get a third interview. But I can't know for sure without seeing the feedback, and that's why I always hesitate to give a full opinion, but anybody who's going to provide some feedback for you. That's always great. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure what that is. Um, huge push at Google to turn contractors into vendors. Yep. The benefit is that vendor roles do not have an end date like six months. Roles include medical, sick days, and even two weeks of vacation per year. Yeah, thanks for sharing this, Max. So, it's a lot of been hearing a lot about this over the last couple of weeks that they're going to change people to vendors. Um, that benefits them. Yeah, they're they're only going to do moves that benefit them. Now, hey, it's really nice to um, get some of these perks like medical and sick days and vacation, but by keeping you as a vendor with no determined end date. It means they can keep you on as a vendor for years. That benefits Google. Um, So it's just important to understand that all their business decisions aren't really going to be about the candidates or the people working there. It's going to be about what's best for the business. Um, And hey, I think it's great to get sick time and medical and and vacation, but it's going to lengthen the time that people stay in a non-full-time role, which is obviously really the goal. Just just for the equity component. Thanks for sharing, Max. I appreciate it. Um, It's something we need to continue to discuss and talk about. Hey, Liz. Okay. In the past few weeks, I've been contacted three to six times for contract work. This makes me think that although a very competitive market for FTEs, FT roles, the work has not gone away. What do you think? The job market's pretty good right now. Again, I I will always say, and and I'm I'm a big believer that the the job creation reports and the unemployment numbers, if you really look into it, it it's kind of BS. Those numbers aren't really accurate or real. Um, so I always recommend that people do research on that. But I do think that right now the economy is, I mean, it's surprisingly resilient. Uh, we really all thought. I mean, I definitely thought. We'd be in more of a recession at this point in 2024. And I've just seen overall more hiring, more openings. Um, so this is all good news. Uh, and I always recommend, hey, like if somebody's going to offer you a contract role, remember that contract roles for the most part should be negotiable. You're just cutting into the agency's margin. And then it's a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, and potentially turn it into a full-time role. And I think pretty much everybody knows I started as a contractor at Google, but uh, I got converted very quickly based on a lot of uh, a lot of luck. Um, and that's kind of the way the world works. You need you need to put all the put all your eggs in the basket to make sure that you're you got all the eggs, I guess. And then you're obviously hoping that you get a little luck along the way. 
P.S. Another comment reminded me that the contract roles are more interesting to me than most FTE positions. So I guess the company saves cash and I make more plus interesting gig, but no security. Yeah, Liz, I mean, I think for where you're at in your career, you're not going to make more as a contractor. You'll probably make less um, in total comp right that that cash component that's going to be taxed the least uh, you're going to make uh, more money in that sense potentially but overall comp probably not uh, but again a great way to get in the door at any organization see if you like it see if you like the leadership the teams the product area um, so contract roles can be pretty good and sometimes when a contract role does pay more than an fte role then paying for something like medical out of pocket isn't as bad now with google it sounds like they're going to cover that with these new vendor roles but um something just interesting to always be thinking about okay. hey ethan hey jeff i've been watching and joining your lives for the past couple months and happy to say i got my offer from google today ethan absolutely amazing okay so congrats now let's move on you got your offer from Google, please, please, please make sure you negotiate anybody on this live. Please, if you get a job offer from Google, people are not negotiating enough. You have to get after it. They are not going to rescind or penalize you for getting after it as long as you're gracious and kind. But those initial equity numbers, they can almost, it just, it depends, but it, they, the equity numbers at Google can almost always be doubled. It's a huge amount. I mean, even at the L3, L4 level, these offers from initial offer to the offer you accept should be going up by 30 or 40 K per year. Okay. And then as we go up the levels, it should go up more and more. So I just cannot emphasize enough. I just, I see the messages I, I get feedback from people and I just know they're not getting after it enough. Anchor high with Google. I have never seen an offer rescinded from them. Never, not once, not ever. I've negotiated over 500 offers with them. Never seen an offer rescinded. So please get after it and congrats. And thank you so much for continuing to show up and letting us know and, and good luck. And you are so welcome. Thank you for being here. I finished my interview at Google and it went well. However, the recruiter informed me that the hiring manager prefers an L5 instead of an L4 for this position. They suggest waiting until mid-year for team expansion, at which point they'll consider hiring for the L4 level. Is this a typical procedure at Google and should I trust and wait? Okay, this is a great, um, it's a great question. So yes sometimes what happens is we go through the process and there is some level misalignment right it were the manager may be looking for balance on their team and they just have a lot of threes and fours and they really just want to bring in some fives that can be good for parity within the within the group i don't know if parity is the right word but um but the biggest thing you need to do is figure out the cadence with your recruiter. Okay, great. When should I check in with you? Should I check in with you June 1st, July 1st? When's a good time to check in? If they're like, I'll, I'll get back in touch with you. Say, look, I, I need to take ownership and control for my life. And so uh, is it okay if I check in once a month, once every two months? You just need to own the check-ins because that that way we get some control and then we can ask do you prefer text or email or phone call or whatever it is it's probably going to be email but we just really want to keep that control item and yes this happens and yes new roles open up um yeah of course we always want to get get it right when the timing hits but um definitely just make sure that you stay in touch with the recruiter that's your number one priority and figuring out a path to just stay in touch with them yeah Liz that is a lot of activity which is awesome to hear <clears throat> Jim I know I couldn't wait to share with you all I'm lucky thanks for the encouragement yeah and so Liz now's the time right like now is the time to double and triple down on your efforts uh usually 
it's just kind of the way it works. Like when we get interviews, we usually get a lot at the same time. Um, and so you want to leverage those opportunities and even for contract roles, have agencies competing against each other. Well, X agency is going to pay me 120 an hour for this role. I'm a little more interested in your role, but it's only coming in at 110. If you could bring it up to 130 an hour, I might consider it right now. Again, we're going to use really nice, soft tone and language there. Um, but you might find yourself in an opportunity to actually have agencies competing with each other to get you in. So it's just an interesting topic. Uh, and obviously, keep us updated. Let us know how we can help. And yes, yes, thank you for all the positive vibes. Again, I always kind of reflect back to the glory days, which I now refer to it as it's like the 2022 when we we just get 10 plus people telling us they got the offers. Obviously, the hiring is just not at that scale anymore. But anybody who comes back and lets us know that they got an offer, it's just a positive vibe, right? It lets people know it's possible because sometimes whether it's Google or these other companies or any job, it can just feel overwhelming. So knowing that other people are landing jobs like that's great. And just knowing that it's possible. Hey, Jeff, to prep for our strategy session, I've been updating my resume, utilizing ChatGPT as an assist. I have not modified my LinkedIn. Should I do that based on the updated resume? Jim, as always, great question. Um, yes. So there's this piece of advice that I simply don't agree with when it comes to LinkedIn, and that's when they say don't copy and paste your resume bullets into the experience section of LinkedIn, why not? Now, if there's anything confidential in there that you need to scrap out, sure. But would you really provide anything super confidential in a resume that you'd be sharing with companies anyway? So copy and paste your experience bullets into LinkedIn. That is a low hanging fruit, takes you five minutes, then you start to hit on the keyword searches. I can go on and on about LinkedIn but you need to literally build it section by section by section. And LinkedIn to me, a million times more valuable than your resume because people can find you on LinkedIn. Now, if you're in job search mode, totally open to work, get that open to work banner on there, get an upgraded LinkedIn account so you can hyperlink in your resume at the top of your LinkedIn profile. But I've said it a million times, but I'll say it again. I got my job at Google because I had a good LinkedIn profile. That's literally it. I didn't do anything. No, yeah, did I pass the interviews? Did I get in and perform as a contractor? Did I have to interview again, get converted? Yeah, I had to go through all those steps, but none of those steps happen without a good LinkedIn profile. They came to me. They reached out to me. And I, I know people don't love LinkedIn. I don't love LinkedIn either but i know that it's a valuable resource with 1 billion global users and it's just a great way to get eyes on your background so absolutely copy and paste that in and we prioritize our resumes because like that's the thing we got to get to companies but once we prioritize our resume we need to tell ourselves that linkedin is actually more important in our job search and that's where we should be spending the bulk of our time thanks for that jim if you have more questions let me know Ethan, thank you to everyone for the congrats. Best advice for anyone going to Google is that the process can take a while. It took me four months. And for some people, it's a year. And for some people, it's two years if they get stuck in team match. It's long. It's it's a process that requires massive amounts of patience. Um, and, you know, it should be blown up and changed. But that's the system. It And it has been that way for a long time. So thanks for reminding people. It's great. Should I keep it long? LinkedIn has lots of history. Thoughts? Um, so I always recommend on LinkedIn that we make ourselves look younger. I mean, this is just a reality of LinkedIn. So if you have like really old positions, and Jim, I think we talked about this maybe a week or two ago in a live session, but if you have older positions that are less relevant, drop them off. Uh, college dates on LinkedIn, not recommended. Um, I recommend that you scrap those out. 
And even if somebody were to look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see my experience starting in 2006. I actually graduated college in 99. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that out loud, but um, so I don't have those first, you know, six years, basically, I graduated in December of 99. So like, I don't have that 2000 through 2005 experience on there. It's really only one piece of experience that was relevant. I had one recruiting role, but for flow, it just didn't make sense. So my career starts in 2006 and then um, my college, I don't have the college dates. And when I was going in and trying to get the role at Google, I had started my career um, in 2009. Now there were some things I wasn't quite as gray as I am now. And I thought I could, I looked a little younger, so I thought I could get away with it. And that's okay too, because like, especially in the U S they can't ask anything about age or anything like that. So I do recommend for people to look younger because especially in tech, there is ageism. It exists. Anybody who tells you it doesn't, it does. Uh, we want to make ourselves look a little younger if it makes sense to do so. Thank you, Jeff. That's a good point. Oh, practice just completed a coding challenge with one and the role is so exciting. I don't want to let myself down. No. Um, and if we were taught maybe starting in high school or college, if, if the focus was all on interview skills and an ability to um, enhance those skills. I mean, interview skills are worth millions of dollars, period. Like if you're able to land those tough jobs, the interview skills are totally worth it. And it's something that we really don't even need to spend that much time. It's not like one of those 10,000 hour items, right? We could prepare for an interview for 15 or 20 hours. And that sounds like an overwhelming amount of time. But when you put in the perspective that that could be tens of thousands more or that could be a career game changer, it's a very limited amount of hours. So um, getting after it is highly recommended, in my opinion. And I just don't I don't believe that people are practicing enough and just the repetition of interview practice uh, will be a game changer in your career. OK, hey, Max. I negotiated an hourly rate for a render role at Google from 80 to 120. Staffing agency tried to negotiate down several times, but I resisted. Hiring manager was pushing to hire me. And they gave me good leverage. Okay, this is awesome. So this is just a quick note for everybody. Um, these contract rates are negotiable. So let's talk about it for a second. So what does it mean? So let's say, um, let's, let's just keep it really basic. Let's say you're going in for a contract software engineer role and Google's willing to pay the agency $100 an hour to find that person. The agency is going to try and find that person at the lowest possible rate to increase their margin and how much money they make. All agency recruiters have a base and commission, right? Some, I think, it's probably required to have a base now, but they're definitely going to have an incentive based job. So you want to make sure you're always negotiating because if they pay you $50 an hour for Google paying them a hundred, it's a hundred percent margin. That's the goal. But if you bring it up to 60, that agency is still going to make really good money on your contract. So it's better for them to bring you in than not bring you in at all. And that's why you can be really tough in negotiating on contract roles because it's like it's an all or nothing for them and so just completely losing you it's not worth it to them thanks for sharing max i appreciate it hey gabriel at max thanks for sharing i needed to join this session today my agency submitted me for two-thirds of my value and i haven't gotten an offer yet but when i do i'll be prepared to negotiate and then Max is your role, technical encoding. And I would just say like, of course, Max, if you want to share, you can. But the reality is, is that I would negotiate any and all contract roles and I would, I would get after a little bit, get after it a little bit. Um, and you can create some fear with these agency recruiters that you will walk away. 
Um, so that's always a potential. Uh, we always want to tell them we're going to walk away because again, they'll, they'll come after us and the role is designed. Okay. We're right at the thirties. Always a great time for me to just quickly prompt on my services and we're at a question. So, um, as I'm doing this, um, any, any questions or comments that come in, please, everything's on the table today. Uh, if you use the coupon code bloom just today till 1159 Pacific time in the U S 15% off the AI tool and 200 bucks off the interview mastery course. Again, that coupon code is bloom. I'm still doing one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions. That's resume, LinkedIn, networking, one-on-one -on -one interview coaching, and one-on-one -on -one negotiation sessions. The AI tool is getting great feedback and we are doubling down on the efforts to implement this feedback and make the tool better and better. And we just get more excited every day about the potential. We look at the competitive landscape and we know we have a best in market tool, but it's going to take some UI updates and we're going to have to beautify and, and give more bells and whistles. And we're taking in all the feedback and incorporating that. Um, if you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every Tuesday and new original content every Monday. All right, let's dive back in. Yeah, okay, it was a design role. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, hi, I aced my TAM interviews last year but couldn't proceed due to a hiring freeze. Recently, the recruiter contacted me to check my interest in, in upcoming openings. How long does it take? Okay. If I'm negotiating the offer for the Toronto location, which stands at a base salary of 123, 95K USD in stock and a signing bonus. I've requested an increase in stock options. Thoughts? Um, so, so you're negotiating. Okay, let's go back. You're negotiating for the offer. They contacted me to check your interest in, in upcoming openings. Okay, so maybe a little bit more context. I think we've gone through this again. And if it hasn't been you, it was somebody else for Toronto for TAM. Um, the base salary at 123. Um, I'm assuming this is a L4 TAM. 123, 95K and USD and a signing bonus. It's probably like your signing bonus is probably low, like between 10, 15, and 20K. Um, and yeah, I'd be trying to get the equity up to 200K-ish. Um, if you just ask them to increase it and they increase it a little bit, ask them again to increase it, but give them a more solid number like, oh, I was really looking for 242 in equity over four years, something like that. Uh, but yeah, just make sure you're negotiating and getting after it. Uh, that's really, really important. So you're doing good work. I'm currently preparing myself this year to eventually get into Microsoft, Google, or Facebook. Okay. And just understand that um, those organizations are, they're going to be a little different, right? So like Microsoft and Google are bigger than Facebook uh, or Meta. Um, and Google and Facebook or Meta uh, will pay significantly more than Microsoft for the same role. Um, so that's just something else to be aware of. Google front loads the equity. So I think always when it comes to front loading equity, like I like that better. I want to take the money now and decide whether I'm going to stay for the long term or not. Whereas both Facebook, and I'm going to keep calling it Facebook meta, both Facebook slash meta and Microsoft, it's going to be a more flat model where the equity is 25% over four years. Okay. Um, so we're out of questions. So we're pretty early on into our live session today. So um, I'm going to kind of hang out and let's see if some more, any questions, any comments, anything that's top of mind for you. Let's maybe take a step back into, oh, let's go, let's go here first. Um, Follow-up question. If the signing bonus is removed, how much can they double with stock option? Um, that varies quite a bit. Sometimes they'll say, Hey, we can move the sign on back into equity. 
I used to always recommend taking that step because it used to be less of an apples for apples. Like if you had a 10K sign on, they used to give you 20 or 30K in equity. If they take 10K and they only give you 10K in equity, I would keep the sign on bonus. I want money now. And this, this coaching has really changed. Two years ago, I would have said, always move the sign on back into equity. Now I strongly encourage taking the sign on because these big tech companies have shown that they will lay off and I want to get all the money now. That's why I love Google's front loading model. I'm going to get more equity. I'm going to get that sign on. Um, you just want to see what they're willing to give you if you move the sign on back into equity. But yeah, I mean, for an L4 TAM in Toronto, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see your equity come up into the high ones. Um, that should be your target. All right, Jim, fire away whenever you're ready. So again, as comments come in, but let's talk a little bit about, and I'll, if comments come in, I'm just going to chat for a couple minutes, then I'll answer those questions. But, you know, the question today was, should I keep going live? And I think it's really kind of just an interesting story to discuss, like what it means to be a YouTuber and what it means to be an entrepreneur. And so on YouTube, taking breaks or any significant break off the platform, YouTube's going to penalize you. You take a couple of weeks off, no big deal. Two to three months off, which is what one of my users recommended or one of my viewers recommended, the algorithm is going to significantly penalize me. And I'm already being penalized for being a long-term creator. YouTube won't really talk about this, but if Sue Smith came onto YouTube now and started creating similar content, they're going to bolster her content as they should because she's a new user and they want to keep her motivated to create content. For older users like me, I'm fighting for every view, right? And that's not a bad thing, but it's just something to note. And then as an entrepreneur, the recommendation to take two to three months off, like I don't make any money if I take time off, right? I'm not an employee, so continuing to keep going. I also launched what I believe will be the most significant part of my business in that AI tool six weeks ago. So these are just things that that won't happen. And if people think I need to take a break, yeah, well, of course, most entrepreneurs um, who grind and work as hard as I do probably need multiple breaks. Uh, but it's part of the reality. It's part of what I signed up for. And to be able to do what I do, you, you have a give and take, right? So the... The give and take is you work more, you're always on, but you don't have a boss, you're your own boss, and you literally are not capped financially. So those are the benefits. I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about because, you know, taking time off, um, I just don't see that as an option. Uh, my business coach probably would tell me that I need to take a long break too, but the reality is, is that... Uh, I just, I have a goal in mind that I've set for myself and I can keep pushing towards that goal until I achieve it. And I don't see any need to, to take a break. I hope that was interesting. <laughs> right, let's go. Uh, I was contacted by Amazon proper, not AWS about a product manager tech role that doesn't on paper look like my background. I've got your recruiter questions ready, but beyond those, how would you approach this one? By the way, first contact about the role in well over two years. Um, okay, so let's let's start with a few things. Okay, um, one to anybody who can perform the product manager role, that is arguably the hottest role out there in the world, and it has been for like two or three years now. That's removing any role that's specialized in AI. That would kind of take the uptick and be the number one. But product has even surpassed software engineers because we know AI is going to impact those roles. And product is paying typically the same, if not better than software engineering roles at this point. So Jim, it's something that I strongly recommend. And the product manager interviews at Amazon are going to be much easier than the product manager interview at Google without question. Like this is one area where the product interviews at Google, I think are probably the, the hardest of any interview where at Amazon, 
just have to have great examples from the last couple of years and be able to answer a ton of behavioral questions. Um, so it's definitely something I recommend getting after. You absolutely want to make sure that the role is the right fit. Um, and you do want to ask the recruiter why they're seeing you as a fit for the role, especially if you don't have a lot of product experience, but just the comp. Well, first of all, they're interesting roles, but the comp has just been, we're, we're on like a three year stretch where the comp for product managers has gone up so much each year that it's just something I always recommend. Oh, keep go keep going live. Okay. Thanks, Liz. Uh, support is invaluable. And I feel like I have a valuable colleague out there in the solopreneur. And I have ideas for you, by the way, need to find time to share. And please, Liz, share uh, via DM um, on Slack. If anybody hasn't joined, we have a free Slack channel. We have over 4,000 members. Hey, it's it's sleepier than it was a couple of years ago, right? There aren't as many comments or questions coming in. Um, but but it's a great way to just see what other questions people are asking outside of the live sessions. And we have a peer practice feature in the Slack group where people are practicing with each other. Again, I don't think it's happening as much as it was in maybe 2021 or 2022, but it's still an option and it's it's all 100% free. Um, so just something that I strongly recommend. And for anybody who has feedback for me, please, please give me that feedback, right? There, everybody's lens is valuable. All feedback is valuable. And so when you're just meeting with people and talking with people or using products, if feedback isn't a default mode for people, oh, it's just, it's a missed opportunity for them to learn and grow. And so I'm always looking for feedback and definitely with our AI tool, like you can always email me at jeff at practiceinterviews.com. We have that chat feature in the app. I mean, I want to get as much feedback on that tool as possible just to make sure that we're continuing to make it better for our users. Okay, thanks, Jeff. You have lots of PM experience. Okay. The, the Slack link still didn't work for me within my login space. Okay, Jim, I want you to do this. Um, just send, just send me, uh, an email at Jeff at practice interviews and say, Hey, send me a, a Slack invite. If you can do that now, Jeff at practice and I'll, I'll make sure you can get into the Slack group. Uh, for all the years I've had that Slack link, um, and, and you need to keep updating it. Uh, it always doesn't work for some people. Uh, I've complained to Slack a million times, asked to speak to somebody to look at my account, but, uh, haven't been able, you can't get anybody live. So it's just been a little bit of a struggle. So definitely email me. Just keep going live. Thanks, Gabriel. Does your AI tool available already? Yep. It's been available for about six weeks. And again, I'll just throw this up here really quickly. Um, if you use the coupon code, actually for the AI tool, it's going to be called a promo code, 15% uh, off if you use that code bloom. Um, if you want to hop on the AI tool, the AI tool is free, uh, but it will only allow you to practice three questions before it shuts you out. And the biggest thing that we did not include in the free feature is that um, we did not include in the free feature the ability to add your own job description. That's a big difference, right? Um, your ability to add and have questions produced off of the job description is important. The other cool thing that I think we really did with that job description field is we removed any rigidity, meaning if you have some notes about the position, you can add the job description and those notes. And then on the back end, we run it through ChatGPT. Our backup system is Claude. If anything goes down on ChatGPT, and it will create questions not only based on the job description, but additional notes that you add in. We really haven't seen a lot of that from our competitors, so we do think that that's a huge differentiator. But if you want to just try it out for free, app.practiceinterviews.com, and you can try out a few questions to get started and see if you like it. Um, but if you want to sign up today, that coupon code BLOOM will get you 15% off your first month. Um, what's the best way to get into a product manager role? especially more entry level. Usually there's some sort of correlation to past experience. What does that mean? It means 
sometimes I see people coming out of like end roles where they really worked a lot with the product team and really got excited about product. Um, sometimes I see it from program managers that spend a lot of time working with the product team. Sometimes it can be sales and marketing. Uh, but having some experience working in the product space, even for entry level, is probably going to you're probably going to need it because it's just, it's so competitive, those roles. And it's not to tell anybody. I always like to take the step back. Anything is possible. I really truly believe that. Um, but having some relation to working with product teams is usually best. And if you haven't had that opportunity, it's something that you can ask for in your current job. Hey, can I get more experience working with product team or asking to work on projects or taking on an extra project with them? But having some understanding of the product space is really helpful. And then you can take product management courses. Um, I really like uh, Try Exponent. If you haven't been to tryexponent.com, um, they have lots of valuable resources to learn more about the product space, product videos, product questions. Uh, but the challenging thing about product, and, and for anybody interviewing for product roles, and Jim, this this kind of applies to you, but not 100% is like if you get hypothetical questions and you're interviewing for a product manager role, too much ideation, not enough execution. So I just see that with my product clients that they're always ideating, 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 but not executing. If you're going to interview for a product manager role anywhere and you get a hypothetical question, uh, just make sure you're moving from ideation to execution because executing on the ideas is going to be the most important item. Behind serving tomorrow. Okay. Um, got an offer for a TPM for Google. The base salary was 30% below my current salary. Communicated that it was below expectations and I'm expecting an answer tomorrow. What should I expect? You should almost always expect with Google that your base salary is going to be lower. Now, I say that with the caveat. If you're coming from another like big company or well-paying company, your base salary is going to be lower. What you're looking for is total comp. Here is the good news. TPM roles have, um, have had a major uptick similar to product over the last few years. That TPM role for total comp should pay you incredibly well. If you just said, hey, this is below my expectations, we don't know what they're going to come back with. So if you didn't give them specific numbers on the equity portion for TPMs, you should absolutely be more than doubling that initial equity number, maybe tripling it, right? So just get after the equity. Definitely make sure you're trying to build in a sign-on, but the base salary is not going to come close. Look at total comp. It does make a difference, but these TPM roles... I have seen, especially over the last two years, some unbelievable offers for TPMs that are so far outside of the scope of what I would have paid a TPM from 2013 to 2015 when I recruited those roles, as opposed to program managers that they pay a little bit more now, but it's pretty close. But those TPM roles are paying significantly more. Get after it make sure you negotiate aggressively on that tpm role again i've seen some fantastic compensation for those roles and good luck hey jeff i'm currently in the team fit process i've been given three to four team fit calls but not successful can you give me a few tips to crack this it's been five months now yeah and first of all sorry this is kind of the the world that people have entered with team matching. Um, I think they should eliminate team match 100% and just get a hiring manager aligned to all the roles. It would remove all of this shenanigans. And back in the day, there just used to be way less team matching than it, there appears to be now. But there's a few critical things to keep in mind in the team match. And I think I'm just going to do a YouTube short. I have a longer video on this if you want to go to my YouTube channel. But there's a few things I want you to really focus in on. First of all, I'm standing, okay? And I'm getting away from the mic for a second. But I'm standing. Why am I standing? Because it brings about more energy, more pitch, more tone in my voice. I recommend that if you're physically capable that you stand 
for the team match just because again it will it will exude more energy that's one secondly you should have fantastic answers to tell me about yourself why the why google and why the role all those answers should be one minute or less and should be very catered to the team and role that you're interviewing or that you're team matching for then my favorite part this is the missing piece of the puzzle not everybody agrees with it and i always have to put that caveat out there ask questions about them too much of these team match calls i i, I know i'm not sitting in them but i know what are the biggest challenges i'm going to face what should i expect in this role i would just flip it and say what do you love the most about the company what do you love the most about the role what do you love the most about working on the team what's the coolest thing you're working on right now love 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 cool if you only have time for four questions they're going to get out of that conversation and think about you from a better mindset because you've used those positive buzzwords and you asked about them this is this is not made up this is science when people talk about themselves the more they talk about themselves the more they like you it is my strong recommendation that the questions are really focused in on them then after you've asked a bunch of questions about them then you turn it and say how do you see me fitting into the team in this role and then you can flip it and ask some questions about yourself i hope that helps it's not uncommon to be in your place to have three or four team fit calls that's actually probably on the higher end um, but it can be a long drawn out process and so patience and staying in touch with your recruiter are going to be critical um, that's interesting that you're using gpt plus claude i've heard good things about claude from others too don't understand what's happening with gemini but can't get the same quality answers okay let's go here first do you think that sometimes launching early and going for more feedback before product is 100 percent finished is a good or not so good strategy <clears throat> so when you're launching a product the product has to work it has to function it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be bugs I, I had a bug in YouTube this morning. I mean, YouTube has how many daily visitors? It's like in the billions. It's something crazy. So like YouTube has bugs. So if my tool has bugs, yeah, that's going to happen. But when you launch a product, it should not be launched in the sense that like it should, everything should work and work appropriately. The biggest lesson that I have learned in my entire life it, from a business perspective and this is something i learned at google and i have applied as an entrepreneur ship you have to ship things if you want perfection no successful person has ever waited for things to be perfect before shipping you have to ship you have to get it out there you have to get the feedback and know that you have delivered a fantastic product on the front end but that you're going to continue to in, to evolve and improve it and when I launched my course, I baited my course for 15 months before I launched it. I got a lot of feedback and then I launched it. Was it the absolute 100% was everything perfect? No, but it was, it was pretty good. You know, that's, that's where I wanted to be. And, and the course has gotten great feedback. The AI tool has gotten great feedback, but I have a use case. Um, and this is getting a little off track and I'm going to go back to the two questions I skipped here in a moment, but I did actually work on an app. Um, this was when I was at Google. I had a side hustle project. I was working on an app that was kind of like a Facebook, but it was more focused in on just all positivity. I don't think that would surprise anybody. What was the challenge? The challenge is, is that the person actually running the app, the founder of the app, wanted perf visual perfection. And it just took way too long to get launched. And I took that as a learning lesson to not do that with my products, to make sure that they worked, functioned, that the user was going to get an excellent experience, but that I wasn't trying to ship perfection. Because if you wait, it just takes way too long and people will beat you to market. They'll, they'll get more things done just because they decided to ship. Um, great question. Do you need knowledge? Do you need technical knowledge for product? 
as a follow-up, what's the best coding language to learn? Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, no, you don't need to have coding to be a product manager. Now, if you're going after a technical product manager role, yes, but for more of an entry level product manager role, you don't need to have coding expertise. And, and if you did, that could be a variety of different coding languages, but that is becoming, I think what happened is, or at least what I saw from Google, I can give Google as the case study. So the Google case study is, is that they were doing those very technical interviews for their product managers for like, maybe they added that for like a year and they had to remove it because nobody could get through the bar. Everybody was getting crushed. So um, most product roles aren't going to have that much of a technical component. And if they do, it should say technical product manager. Yes. Congrats. Yep. Thank you, Jim. At Jeff's site, practice interviews for outbound practice interviews for outbound PM at Google team match is gone. They have moved to hiring manager plus relevant team loops. I believe this has been applied to all PM roles at GCP. Okay, great. And, and you know, again, this is what I would want to see from them. Um, it's really important to understand that the outbound product manager role uh, pays less than the, than the regular product manager role because it's, it's a little bit more, again, outward facing marketing focus. So, I recommend when people can get into the product manager role uh, at Google, like try and go for the regular PM role. Obviously, if you can get in the door, great, but just a, just my two cents. Follow up on the team PM offer. I told my current salary value and the recruiter sent that value to the comp team slightly higher so they could meet me in the middle. Is this something that usually happens? Well, you shared that information, so we can't unshare that. Now, yes, you share information. The recruiter goes back to the comp team. But equity, my best guess is that there's a huge equity play that you haven't done yet. Make sure you say, okay, you can't meet me on the base. I'm looking for an equity of 475 over four years. Can you please take the, my expectations back to the comp team and advocate for me? Thank you so much. So you just need to make sure you're driving up that equity because again, on the TPM roles, there's tons of room to move. And don't be shy about asking. Remember, that's their job to advocate for the, for you. It's not their money. It's Google's money. And it's not going to impact them one way or the other. So just make sure you're negotiating strongly. This Myers, when is a product ever 100%? I would say the MVP has actual value to a customer. Launch it, then iterate. And that's that's what the initial paid version of the AI tool is. It's an MVP. That's it. It's an MVP and then you go to and you build the roadmap. And so we have the next three phases built out in the roadmap and those are constantly changing and evolving based on user feedback and based on our target audience as well. Jim, good point. I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I still haven't launched and this is hurting me. So point well taken. I knew I had to join this call today. There used to be somebody I followed really early on um, in my entrepreneur journey. I can't remember them, their name, but they used to always brag about all the spelling errors that they had in their content. Now, bragging about spelling errors, I don't really think that's right. But like in my course, I know in one part of the course, I, I do have a spelling error. It's been highlighted by a few people. To go back and actually change that spelling error would be quite a bit of work, so I haven't done it. Does that take away from the course at all because there's one small spelling error in there? It really doesn't. Um, people are still also reading the word as the word it was intended to be, even if they notice that there's a spelling error. Like there's lots of these cool tricks where if things are spelled out and they're even close, like our brains will just naturally go to reading the word in the correct way. So Something as small as that might have stopped somebody. They might have pulled down the course, fixed it all up. But the reality is, is I just want to get value to as many people as possible. And going back and fixing one spelling error, it's it's just not super important. I bought a $5,000 course that had audio issues, 
uh, multiple spelling errors, but the value was still there. It, those things didn't take away from the value of the content. And that's the most important piece, Liz. Oh, yes, I love this. Perfection is the enemy of progress. Great, great quote. At Brad, next week, hope I've gotten into the app store. Amazing. And Liz, just, just get after it, right? Um, again, I, I look at like, I look at Google and like, again, I, I had like a Gmail thing come up. I've had a, I've had a workspace thing come up. I had a YouTube thing today. Like that's a, this is a trillion dollar company or whatever their value is today. Right. And, and they'll, they're still going to have bugs. So just know that whatever you do, it's not going to be perfect. And that's okay. And that's okay. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for this amazing advice you put out. I'm a software engineer with two years of experience. Recently, I've been contacted by a startup who want me to be the first hire. Okay. There's a more senior role like founding engineer, but I'm concerned if this jump will look like a title over inflation in the future. Could this be a problem? What do you recommend doing? No. Titles are relevant to company size. So you could go in as like lead engineer or principal engineer and it's a startup with like very few people. And then when you go to a company like Google and they're like, well, it looks like you're a principal, you'd say, yeah, it's a smaller company. So it's a bigger title. I'm definitely willing to take on the title of software engineer, et cetera. Titles are all relevant to size, right? And so like a VP role at one company might be a manager or might be an individual contributor role at another company. It's not something that I would worry about. I would say if you're really excited about the opportunity, you see the potential, you like the team, you like leadership, the comps, right? Go for it. Thanks again for hosting these. Have a great week. Okay, awesome. We are just past the hour mark. It's always fun to get to an hour. It means that we had a, had a good, engaging discussion today. So let's do this. I will answer any additional questions that come in but let me go ahead and go into my wrap up again. If anybody has anything that's lingering, please come in and ask it, but I'm going to go into my wrap up now and happy to answer those last minute questions. So if you use the coupon or promo code bloom, 15% off the AI tool today and 200 bucks off the interview mastery course, the AI tool is app.practiceinterviews.com and the course can be found at practiceinterviews.com. I'm still doing one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions that's both the strategy sessions are both um resume linkedin and networking then i'm still doing one-on-one -on -one interview coaching obviously my most popular service one-on-one -on -one negotiation coaching and that interview mastery course which again just today to 11 59 pacific time 200 bucks off if you like what i did today <clears throat> please smash that like button if you've never subscribed I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every single Tuesday, new original content every Monday. I'm going to answer these last few questions and hop off. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you. <coughs> Great to see you again. Back in the market soon after Meta contract. Fang is in everything. Yeah, I prefer a government job with a pension and only a nine to five. Good luck, everybody. Yeah, and remember, everybody has different goals, and we got to recognize that. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with a nine to five if you enjoy the work, you have good leadership. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so uh, everybody is unique and different. And yeah, Fang isn't everything. The two things that Fang companies offer, or Manga, or whatever we're calling it these days, is they offer great comp and a very valuable brand and that valuable brand that's kind of the most important item because the valuable brand is priceless thanks chef for all the great advice even a bit of a group therapy to conquer perfectionism ship you should put a sticky note up somewhere in liz today that just says ship and just have it up be looking at you whether it's in your bathroom mirror or on your computer or whatever it might be ship because <clears throat> once you do, you'll be so proud of yourself and you won't look back and then you'll get the feedback you need to get 
to improve and iterate. If you don't, if you don't ship it, you'll never know. Oh, I'm in an office and yes, I'm in an office. Um, I am, I have the best commute, um, in the world and I always like to share it. My commute is 0.6 miles. Um, I, ride my beach cruiser i'm in san diego so the weather pretty much allows it year round i ride my beach cruiser to the office every day um and it's wonderful and there is a trick here i don't really share this trick but the way i've set things up is very intentional meaning that this is similar to an interview i have the light coming in on my face so i'll always have a big window with light coming in so you can see me clearly. Um, I also like that the cars are moving in the background. Um, you can see, so that's the reflection of the glass back out onto the street. That actually keeps you as the viewer engaged longer. If it's just static me against a white wall, it's not going to be as interesting. I know it's weird, but I learned all these things about motion. And so even if you watch some of my earlier videos, those were very intentional that they were outside so you could get the reflection of the trees wavering back and forth. That was to keep you focused because I'm not going to do all the camera angles where it's here and here, oops, here and here and here. It's just I'm not going to have it that highly produced, but there is something to be said for having motion behind me that keeps the audience's attention. I know it's a really weird thing to be thinking about, but I always find it to be so interesting. Hey, William, your YouTube videos are helpful as I'm trying to use your YouTube videos to become better prepared. I want to become a Google DC tech. Awesome. And those DC tech roles are great. They're great uh, roles to get into. Um, they pay really, they pay well considering the space in comparison to other roles. So just keep at it. Just know the inner workings of a data center, right? Like that's going to be the most important. So talking about how you would problem solve or troubleshoot things in the data center like, and how you've done it in the past. Okay, everybody, we are out of questions. I will sit in the silence and space for a moment as additional questions come in. But as we kind of hit the lull, I'll, I'll be signing off here in a second. You worked at a, as a DCT at another data center for five years. Awesome. Those interviews are going to be really, really good. Now, behavioral focus in on times. Again, troubleshooting, challenges, problems, communication, all those things. And then how would you do it? How would you do it at Google? Um, a server goes down in the data center. What do you do? Um, there's an issue with the cables. What do you do? You don't have internet service. How do you handle troubleshooting things? Items like that, questions like that are going to be really valuable. Have to be able to answer hypothetical questions as a DC tech as well. Okay, let's see. Any last minute questions? Gabriel, appreciate everything you do. Thank you a lot, sir. Thanks for being here. Um, I appreciate this community. I I can't do it without all of you. So I, I sincerely appreciate everybody who shows up and, and obviously people who continue to show up week after week. Um, it just keeps us flowing. It keeps the conversation going. In 2022, there'd be 100 to 200 people on these lives because the job market was crazy. Um, it's not that way anymore. And that's okay. I'm just so happy when everybody shows up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for all the information. Question, I'm looking for a more senior role in the program management space. I'm a non-technical background and have 10 years of experience. What are some advice on the team match phase? Yeah, so um, a more senior role in the program management space, like this is kind of moving up into maybe your leading program managers. In the team match, it's just all about positive energy, space, knowing answers to common questions like tell me about yourself why the company why the role and asking great questions of the person doing the team match why do you love the company why do you love your role what's the thing you love about the team the most we got to ask questions about them um, and this is just a general item for all job interviews questions typically come at the end when they spend the last five minutes, 10 minutes of that conversation talking about themselves, what's going to be the result? They're going to like you more. 
And that's just data and science. Um, and that's a lot of my coaching is based on more data, science, and psychology than anything to do with interviews. But I had to chat with thousands and thousands of people to kind of learn these tips and tricks. Okay, I think we've hit a good stopping point. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for being here today. I'll flash this up one last time. And then I'm going to hop off use the coupon code or promo code bloom 15% off the AI tool and 200 bucks off the interview mastery course that will expire at 1159 Pacific time today. App.practiceinterviews.com is where you can get the AI tool and then practiceinterviews.com to get the course. Thank you everybody so much for being here. I'll be back next week, Tuesday, 9am Pacific time. Take care.